Welcome to the Find Your Leadership Confidence Podcast with Vicki Nedling. You are about to discover impactful lessons that help you grow as an individual, grow your confidence, and find the positive and good within you, so you powerfully and authentically become the best version of yourself. Be sure you visit our website at www.findyourleadershipconfidence.com. While you're there, subscribe to us via your favorite network. Now tune in, get ready, and enjoy the journey of emerging as a leader of exception in the 21st century. Welcome everyone to the Find Your Leadership Confidence podcast. I'm your host, Vicki Nethling, coming to you from Roswell, Georgia. The goal of this podcast is to bring topics and guests that will empower you to become that confident leader and take your business and your life to the next level. Today, I am very excited to talk with Brian Clayton, and let me tell you about Brian. So Brian is an entrepreneur, an author, and speaker who has built a successful career by focusing on hard work, perseverance, and innovation. He is the co-founder and CEO of GreenPal, an online platform that connects homeowners with lawn care professionals. Under Brian's leadership, GreenPal has grown into a multi-million dollar company with over 200,000 active users and has been featured in publications like Forbes, Inc. and Entrepreneur. Prior to starting GreenPal, Brian founded Peachtree Inc., a landscaping company that he grew to become one of the largest in the state of Tennessee with over $10 million in annual revenue. Peachtree was eventually acquired by Lusa Holdings, a national company. Brian has been also recognized for his leadership and entrepreneurial spirit by organizations like Nashville Business Journal, which named him one of its 40 under 40 honorees. Brian's entrepreneurial journey is a testament to the power of hard work, determination, and willingness to take risk. He is passionate about helping others achieve their own success and is always looking for ways to give back to his community. Today, I thought we'd talk about lessons in customer experience. Please join me in welcoming Brian Clayton. Hiya, Brian. I'm doing great, Vicki. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me on. Uh, it is my pleasure. As I mentioned to you before we got started, I love talking about customer experience. Um, I'm of the age where uh, the customer experience mapping and such was just introduced to folks uh, a few years back now. And it was really interesting, um, the whole process that went through it. But uh, I, as a coach and a trainer, I I think you always have to remind people that you are there to please the customer. Absolutely. And and, um, if your mission and vision and goals don't align with that, then there's something that you need to adjust. But before we get into all that good stuff, let's uh, ask that simple question I always ask, and that is, where do you come from? Where do you live? I am from Nashville, Tennessee, and uh, spent most of my life growing up in Nashville. And it's actually one of the luckiest things that ever happened to me because Nashville is a thriving, growing local community. It was a great place to start my first business and sell it. It's been a great place to start Green Pal. Awesome. Yeah, I have been to Nashville now three, three times. Awesome. And have yet, yet to go to my most favorite place of all. And that would be to see all of those country music stars in their little bars and things. Uh, Gotta do it. (laughs) Two times it was uh, because of COVID and COVID was so high that I just didn't feel safe going. And then the other time was prior to COVID and I was too busy in a conference to leave. (laughs) It's like, no, I have to go. I love country music and all of those places. No place like it in the world. I mean, I there's, a, there's no, it's, there's no other city in the world that that owns an entire genre of music. So yeah, you got to yeah. come back. Yeah, I definitely do. So I gave a lot of of your accolades and things like that, but I always like to ask the question: You know, what is your your story? You you didn't start out as this highly successful person. Talk to us about the journey that took you 
from that beginnings, you know, young guy out of college or whatever to where you are today? Yeah, it actually started uh, really humbly uh, with just me and a push mower. And <laughs> I'd like to tell you that I was a born entrepreneur, but I actually, I think my dad got tired of watching me play Nintendo all day. And I, I, I remember it <laughs> like it was yesterday. He He came into my room and said, hey, get off your butt. I got a gig for you. You're going to go mow the neighbor's yard. And he made me go cut the neighbor's grass. <laughs> and, uh, and luckily he did, because after that, I remember I got paid 20 bucks for like an hour of work. And in 1995, that was a lot of money. Yeah. And I thought, this is incredible. I can just, I can just do this and, and, and make as much money as I want. So, uh, the first thing I did was I, I passed out some flyers all over the neighborhood and I, and I was in the lawn mowing business and, and I stuck with that little lawn mowing business all through high school. And then, uh, all through college, I went to school at night and uh, mowed grass during the day. And then when I graduated college from business school, I had to make a pretty tough choice. Um, I, was I going to stay in this lawn mowing business, uh, or was I going to go into, uh, the, you know, what my, yeah. what my, my classmates were doing, getting a job and a, building a career at a company somewhere. And, and I didn't really want to be a lawn guy. I didn't like, I hated the lawn mowing business actually. It, 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 but I thought, you know, owning a, a service-based business could be my lane uh, because I was making pretty good money and I had a couple of helpers. So I remember I, I, I on the back of a legal pad, I, I made a little business plan with, with what I did learn in business school. And, and over what I thought would take me 10 years, I was able to get done at about three. Mm -hmm. And over a 15 year period of time, I built that to a $10 million a year business around 150 employees and then uh and then it ended up getting acquired by a big national company in the industry and so that's how I got my start and and just stuck with that business and and sold it and then after that I took about a year off and I got really bored and I thought okay I need I need another mission I need another reason to mm -hmm. get out of bed in the morning I need yeah. something to pour my soul into and I had the idea that an app should exist where you should be able to push a button and somebody mows your yard for you because I knew the lawn mowing industry really well I didn't know anything about tech, but I was fairly certain somebody was going to build an app that worked like Uber, but but for lawn mowing. And so I thought, okay, why can't it be me? I recruited two co-founders, and we started working on on the idea, and, and that was ten years ago. So now Green Pal is a ten-year overnight success nationwide, United <laughs> States, around three hundred thousand people using the app. That's awesome, and you know I love that that one dad gets you out of the house kind of thing yeah. changed, changed your life. And it's really true. You know, really did. One, one decision you make can be life changing. Uh, you, how do you really, as you think about this and, and you said you didn't like the business, but I think it's important. That was an important thing to, for the audience to hear because you may not like where you are, but how can you take that to a different level? So you, you know, okay, well, I don't like doing this work all the time, but I sure as heck could be the boss <laughs> and I can yeah, I, you take know, the I, leadership I, I, role. Exactly. It, 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 uh, it's a tough business and, and every business is tough. Um, it doesn't matter if you're running a hot dog stand or, or a lawn mowing business like I had. It, it's a hard, every business is hard. And so I think the advice, follow your passion, I think is bad advice. Because very, very rarely can you make a living on your passion. Very, very, it's very rare that somebody um, it can 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 derive profit from something they're passionate about. So, for me, I was never passionate about the lawn mowing business. I was never passionate about cutting grass, but I was passionate about building something bigger than myself and and helping uh, employees get where they were trying to go and 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 being successful in something was something that I was passionate about and and also my personal development and growth um, that if you're if you're throwing everything you have into a business you evolve into a whole new person every year or two and so you're learning things like leadership and management and you're learning like 20 other skills that you kind of have to learn to, to be in the game and I liked that about it uh, because I was growing and evolving and, and, and in such a way that I wouldn't have otherwise if I didn't have a business. So all of those things I was passionate about, but I hated the smell of fresh cut grass and I still do. <laughs> and, and so I think, I think find, find passion um, uh, in, in, in the, in the journey, in the process and in the results, but 
if you run a, you know, if you, if you run a coffee shop, you don't have to be passionate about coffee. You know, in fact, it's probably better that you're not, it's probably better that you're monotically focused on the systems and processes and the, and the, and the accounting and economics of the coffee business and not brewing coffee. Yeah. And, and I think it's important too, when you talked about the, you got the idea for the app and, and I know every time I get a new idea, I just get the excitement and everything is the drive that makes me want to get up in the morning, you know, matter what time of day and, and that knowing that you don't know what to do, but willing totally. to find somebody. So again, all of that is really what I think makes being an entrepreneur so exciting and and scary and, and fun all at once. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It can be one of the most rewarding things that you do with your life on this planet is starting a business. Um, you don't have to build a big business either. You can yeah. you can keep it keep it a small business, and I promise you. You will, you will do things you never would have done otherwise. You'll read mm -hmm. books you never would have read. You'll listen to podcasts you'll never would have listened to because you have to in order to right. get from one, one level to the next. So you don't build a multi-million dollar business. You don't build a, a small business. You don't, you don't build any business unless you're focused on the customer experience. So how do you measure at GreenPal, the customer satisfaction, um, you know, what steps do you take to make sure that these online booked customers are getting the service that they want and they're happy with it and they're going to be repeat customers and, and even better yet, tell others about you? Yeah, no, no successful business can be built uh, on unhappy customers. So, and we have a saying, listen to your customers or you will have none. And so, especially in the early days when we were first building the app, we we didn't really know what features it needed. We didn't know where we were upsetting people. We didn't know where we were, we were delighting people. We had to, you know, the 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 first hundred customers, maybe a thousand customers, had my cell phone number, and and I would be on the phone with them seven days a week. The email from the system went to my personal email inbox because you need that feedback. You need to listen to what they're saying. So you kind of know where to focus your firepower and know what, what to improve on. After you get a little bit of momentum going and you've got some kind of product out the door and you've got maybe a hundred or a thousand customers, then you kind of have to start looking at the data and you kind of have to start looking at, okay, what are the signals um, mm -hmm. from our customer behavior and how do we, how do we use that to make better decisions? And that's one of the, the good things about running a technology business because you, you, you get all of this data, yeah. whether it be actual implicit data or implied data. So what I mean by that is, um, you know, on our system, we have a rating system. So after, after somebody hires a lawn mowing service, they get to rate them one through five stars. We all know that system, right? And so we, we use that to understand uh, our customers happy with the service. Are they not? Which vendors are doing well? Which ones aren't? But we also use, um, implied signals like do they book them a second or third time they may have left them a five-star rating but did they book them a third fourth or fifth visit because they they need the lawn mode every week and so yeah. did they use the system did they use the vendor they hired so we, we use that to understand okay these are the vendors that are doing well these are the ones that aren't doing so well and this is how we can kind of like promote the ones that are doing well and, and demote the ones that aren't so we're always on the fly taking that data in and understanding it, understanding it, measuring it, and trying to use it to make customers even happier and make it quicker, faster, cheaper, smoother, more convenient. And it's never ending. It, you're never done. And and that's one of the fun things about it. It's just because you solve one problem doesn't mean that you're done. You, you, you have to be a never ending problem solving machine um, to to make it in in in, the, in today's business world. And and so that's one of the fun things that I enjoy about it. Yeah. And, and you really can't be in, well, in any business, but especially a service related business, an absentee owner or manager or whatnot, because all that data also probably is used to be um, part of the hiring process, the orientation process, the evaluation process, you know, you get that data. So if you do have somebody that maybe is performing less than stellar, how, how can you use that to, to correct that situation. Totally. Yeah. It's, 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 <laughs> I think the idea of passive income is a myth, you know, maybe if you own real estate or, or, or a bond or something like that, but if you want a business, you're going to be wrangling it all the time. And, and mm -hmm. you're going to be looking at things like customer satisfaction and what customers are saying to make adjustments on the fly. 
because it's never done. It's it's always a continual improvement. Um, and, and you're using that, that customer feedback to understand what needs to be fixed and where you need to be focusing it, You know, the minute you turn your back, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll come back to your business and it'll, 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 if it's still there, you know, there was mm-hmm. times when my first company, if I had taken a vacation longer than three days, my business would have evaporated. So it's, it's certainly with green pal, it's kind of the same thing. We are, we are always looking at those customer metrics. Yeah. So what is your approach to managing um, your team at GreenPal then? Are, how do you make sure that they stay aligned with the the cus- company's goals and vision and, and also don't poach your people? Like, oh, well, <clears throat> I got these people and they love me, so I should just start my own business. Yeah, well, so in the first business I had, that was a problem because it was very low barriers to entry where somebody could go strike out on their own and start their own landscaping company. And then a lot of times they would come back because they would realize, Oh, that's a lot harder than I thought. Yeah. But, but with green pal, it's, 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 uh, it's a little different. It's, it's, it's kind of like if you were working for Uber or Airbnb or Instacart or DoorDash, it's really kind of hard to strike out on your own and pop up your own network of buyers and sellers. And so that, that it makes it difficult to build, but it also makes it very defensible uh, from competition, and and mm-hmm. because it's the it's a, it's a network effect. Because the more buyers that use it, the more sellers that use it, and they kind of reinforce the the durability of it. So that's not something we really um, have to deal with. But you know, how do you how do you keep the right people on the bus, and 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 how do you keep mm-hmm. everybody uh, aligned with what the hell it is we're trying to do here? Why we get out of bed in the morning, and, and why does it matter? And one, one of the little tactics that we do is I make everybody, we have 43 people, and I make everybody do at least one hour a week of customer support. I, I do one hour a day um, because I never want there to be this weird gap between founder logic mm-hmm. and customer logic. And if you if you don't do your own customer support, this weird gap forms where the founder or the team is looking at the problems from one kind of perspective and the customers are, are looking at the, at the problem and solution from another perspective. And, and then everybody's like upset all the time and, and nobody mm-hmm. understands what's going on. So if you do your own customer support, it helps close that gap. And so I make everybody do at least an hour a week. The other thing I do is uh, everybody must go out in the field for a full day uh, once per year to ride along with one of our vendor partners. And this kind of reinforces it doesn't matter if you're an engineer, if you're a designer, if you're a content mm-hmm. creator, it, it reinforces, okay, this is why we're doing what we do. We help these small business owners grow their business. We help connect them with with homeowners that need them. And this is really why we're all here. And so those, those tactical, like actual, like real world experiences, I think can kind of help course correct and fix a lot of the small stuff. And, and, and so long as I'm running the company, we'll, we will always be doing that. Yeah, when I worked for both Arby's and, and UPS, we did that same thing. All the salespeople had to work a week in the store. I love and it. And anyone that was developing technology or whatnot um, had to go out and and work just I love for it. a few days or, you know, depending on what you were doing. But it really was important, uh, even as when I had uh, administrative people working with me and I, I sent them to one of our hubs to watch packages go through our system to know how to pack a package right so that it wouldn't make it through the system, you know? You watch that show I, Undercover Boss, and it's always yeah. hilarious. Like like yeah. the CEO of, I don't know, I watched one about Dunkin' Donuts not too long ago, and the CEO was trying to run a, a simple Dunkin' Donuts operation and couldn't do it. And they're always comical. And and I think if you are a manager or a founder or, or a CEO of, 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 of a business, no matter what size, you need to be like cognizant of that, that you don't want, you don't want to be that funny CEO on undercover boss. You, you, mm-hmm. you want to be able to run those systems. You want to be able to know the business from, from the inside out, from the top down. And one way to do that is to do your own support and to actually go get in the trenches, at least on a, on a monthly basis. Yeah. And as sometimes as companies hire outside people to take on those key roles, I think it's sometimes a mistake because unless that high level person does roll up their sleeves and do that because you can't really understand the vision and the mission of the company if you don't understand the operation and the exactly 
Exactly. And, 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 and be in their shoes at least for a moment. Yeah, for sure. So how do you balance needing to innovate and stay ahead of the competition and, and really maintain that focus on what your foundation or your core business is? Yeah, for us, the way we look at it, there's a couple of other services that you can use to to hire lawn mowing online. And then there's a bunch of places where, where you can get names and phone numbers. There's, there's Angie's list, home advisor, mm-hmm. thumbtack, Craigslist, but they're not like us in the sense that we can push a button and somebody comes out and does it. So we, we kind of compete with them, but not really. So the way we look at it is it's not who you compete with. It's what you compete with. And so what we compete with, it's not necessarily the home advisors or the or the Facebooks or Yelps of the world. We, we compete with people doing it the same way they did it in, in 1995, yeah, right. which is I ask a, a friend who they use or a neighbor who they use, or I ask a friend or, or somebody from church, or I, I see somebody and flag them down. And that's not actually the most efficient way <laughs> to get the best price and 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 best reliability on the service and so it's a lot easier to just download our app pop your address in you'll get five quotes and you can hire the best price at the best at the best reliability in minutes rather than like flagging somebody down in the street so that's what we compete with and and uh we might be five times better than the status quo right now but we need to be 10 times better and so we're always looking for ways to make it faster, smoother, cheaper, more reliable to, to hire a lawn mowing service on our system than doing it the old way. Cause we really kind of mm-hmm. compete with the old way of doing it. And so I, I wonder in businesses, a lot of times you have to have some sort of reward system to really keep you maintain your, your loyal staff or your, your good people, you know, people will always totally. try to, so in your business, uh, what type of reward system do you have for your people that go out in the field? The first thing is you you have to, I think the first 10 or 20 people you hire need to be a little weird. They And, and what I mean by that is you don't want to just hire somebody that worked at big company X, Y, or Z to come work for your small business because it probably won't be a good fit. So that's the first thing. we The way I think about it is, is we want to hire – Pirates and romantics. So pirates mm-hmm. are, are you know, like they just kind of want to do things a little unorthodox. They're, they're scrappy. They want to be a part of a lean, nimble team that can move quickly and experiment and try things. Or romantics where they just kind of want to, they, 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 they love the idea of what the business does. They want to be a part of the vision. They want to be a part of something that's doing things differently. They're romanticized about the idea of inventing something. And so that's what I look for when I'm hiring. And so, and that kind of helps take care of a lot of the downstream things on, on motivating people and, 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 and all of like the, 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 the little nitpick things you deal with when when you, when you have a team of more than two or three people, I learned that the hard way in my first business, I would just hire anybody with a pulse. And, and, uh, I woke up one day and there was a hundred, hundred some odd people there and, and most of them disliked me and I disliked most of them. And it was all my fault because I built it. So I, I learned that the hard way building my first company that in the second business, I was really careful about who I brought on. And then the next thing we do is, is we try to keep it fun in, in the sense of we have little competitions inside of the business um, because, you know, we have a vision. We want to be the easiest way for, for somebody to hire a lawn mowing service. And we want to be the easiest way for somebody to make six figures in the lawn mowing business in a year. That's what we do. That's why we get out of bed in the morning. But the work can be grueling. It's a, it's a grind. Building a startup is a grind. And and that vision and that mission uh, will only take you so far. So you kind of have to do things to keep it interesting. And so we have little monthly contests inside of the business where we compete over certain things, whatever the <laughs> whatever the objective is uh, on that given month. And uh, like for, for one month last year, we needed to boost our uh, – our press mentions. And so we, we, uh, we had a little competition to see who could get us in the press the most in that given month. And, and the winner got a, a $5,000 Airbnb gift card. And so mm-hmm. that was a lot of fun, uh, where we all kind of competed with each other. Yeah. And, and, uh, and so I look for ways to instill little, little competitions inside of the business to kind of keep the energy, um, flowing and, and, and incentivize people to, to, to always be mindful of what it is we're trying to do, but make it fun while we're doing it. That's awesome. 
So what would you uh, give to other entrepreneurs that may be struggling to raise capital, you know, to uh, start a business uh, is financially draining at times. <laughs> so how did you secure funding for GreenPal? Yeah, it's uh, it's something that I come across a lot where a founder will say to me, oh, I have this idea for a business and I'll, and I'll start it if I can go raise capital. And I think that's a, I think that's the wrong way to look at it. I think you should, you, you should not want to start the business dependent on if you can raise capital or not. I think you should just start it. You should just take it as far as you can without capital and de-risk it. And, and there's a lot you can do without money um, nights and weekends. You can get a prototype going. You can get, you can hand crank a, a new business with spreadsheets. Um, it doesn't have to run at scale yet. You can get 10 customers and, and, uh, and, and that's actually what we did. And, uh, and, and so you can kind of, you can kind of de-risk what the business is and what it does. And that, that, that attracts capital. And yeah. the thing you have to remind yourself of, and one of my favorite quotes is uh but steve martin said be so good you can they can't say no so you kind of have to be so good investors can't say no and and right. so you have to have, you have to have a story where it's just you're demonstrating with action that that you're relentless about getting this business going and that takes care of a lot of the issues around raising capital the other thing i'll say is it, I started to raise capital when we started Green Pal, and I realized, man, this is going to be a year of me just going around begging for checks. I'd rather just build a business with that time, and that's what I did. And mm -hmm. and we got to a point where we didn't need to raise capital, so we didn't we didn't raise any outside money for the business. So I would encourage you to to self fund the business off of its own revenues because that kind of keeps you really clear on one thing: customers. Um, mm -hmm. So. The first, the first piece of advice is self-fund the business off of its own revenues. If you get to a point where you see that raising money can help you go 10 times faster, then do that. But then, but then make the business where it's a no brainer, where, yeah. where you would invest, like you would mortgage your mother's home and invest that money into the business until you're that sure about it, that don't, don't try to go out and raise money. Awesome advice. So you talked about kind of word of mouth marketing and how are you utilizing social media to be able to uh, grow your business, get your customers, show how uh, that customers are delighted by your service? How are you using social media? Yeah, for a long time, social media was something we ignored uh, because I tested it in the beginning and and we couldn't get any customers off of it. And so the first two or three years, we did nothing but build content for Google organic search. So when you search for a lawn mowing service nearby you in Lincoln, Nebraska, or wherever you live, uh, we pop up as an option. And that's how we got all of our customers. And now probably half of our customers come come to the property that way. And then the other half just come from word of mouth. And then we I ignored social media for five, six years. And then I started hearing from during my one hour a day or two hours a day of customer support, I would start hearing from from people on phone or in live chat. Hey, I, I looked at, looked you guys up on Facebook and are you in business? Um, you know, and, and, uh, and, or, or they'll say, you know, I tried to find you on Instagram. I couldn't find you. And, and so then I, I, I it became an aha moment for me that social media wasn't necessarily a way to get new customers. It was a way to get kind of customers that were on the fence to convert yeah. because it's kind of like a like a check like people will will check you out on facebook or instagram or tiktok or pinterest or twitter just to make sure that you're a legit business and that you're putting out putting out good looking content and so we started investing in it a little bit more and more and more and we started noticing that new customers weren't coming through social media but our activation rate was going up like like mm -hmm. like five to seven percent of people that were considering us that got free quotes ended up hiring because when you look at our Facebook, look at our Instagram, look at our Twitter, it looks like a, like a living, breathing, well-run, nice. thriving business. And so, so that's how we look at it. And it's well worth the investment for us now. I think in the early days, you can't be good at everything at the same time. So I think it's okay mm -hmm. to like put it on the back burner for a while, but at a certain point in time, you're going to have to develop a routine around making sure those properties look really good. Yeah. And if, if you're not, into it, comfortable, get a VA to do it for you. Just yeah, come out totally. to them. <laughs> awesome. Better than nothing. Yeah, a, That's a, a right. VA, a it VA is, true. is better than nothing. That's exactly right. 
Well, time has flown by. Uh, what's next for you as my rapid fire question? You know, I'm having fun running this business. I've, I've been in it for 11 years, 10, 11 years now, and there's been some hundred hour weeks, but I haven't worked a day in a decade. It's always been what I wanted to do. It's mm -hmm. always been the thing I wanted to work on. So I'm going to keep running it so long as I'm having fun doing it. We're, we're, we've got 300,000 people using the, the product now to get lawn mowing done. We want to get to a million. And so I think I can get the business there. And so that's what we're focused on. That's what's next for us. A million people using it every week for lawn mowing. Ever thinking about international? There's grass everywhere, you know. Possibly, <laughs> possibly. These invisible lines between our countries are very real when it comes to when it comes to business. Uh, we've toyed with the notion of Canada because we we do well in Seattle and Vancouver's right there. Um, but everything's different from from the way you market yeah. on Google to the way you handle money and payment processing and all that. So at some point we will, but we've got a lot of low hanging fruit fruit still in the states. Yeah. Well, there's something to think about. <laughs> totally. <laughs> All right. For those that are just listening, you know the drill. You should go grab that paper and pencil right away. I'm going to share my slide that has the contact information. I will read the website for you that if you're just listening, but you know that you can go to my website, findyourleadershipconfidence.com, or to my YouTube channel, please subscribe and be able to get all this in my show notes. So the website is yourgreenpal.com. That's yourgreenpal.com. On LinkedIn, you can find it by his name, Brian Dash Clayton. And Instagram, Brian M. Clayton, M like Mary. And Twitter is the same, Brian M. Clayton. I'm going to turn it over to Brian to be able to talk to you about what you can find on the website and you know how you can get involved if you need your lawn cut. <laughs> there you go. Yes, yeah, super simple. If you have a lawn that you need to get mowed, rather than calling all over town on Craigslist or something like that, just go to GreenPal. Uh, you can go to GreenPal.com or YourGreenPal.com and pop your address <laughs> in. You'll get five free quotes and hire the one you want to work with. Awesome. So easy. And so again, uh, YourGreenPal.com is where you want to go. Uh, as he said, he's on social media, so do, do check that out. Leave some comments. If you did use a service to let him know, you know, this is all about the customer experience. Let them know what your experience was like. So, Brian, it's been great talking to you. I loved hearing all about it. You know, it took me back as you were starting to talk. When I was a teenager, I used to go, my grandmother had a 60-acre farm. And so they had a riding lawnmower. And I found it very relaxing and, uh, <laughs> I don't know, thought-provoking uh, time to be on the lawnmower for hours <laughs> cutting their grass. But I developed well, an allergy to grass. Oh, no. Grass. <laughs> so the thing that I love to do, I can't do. I, I even have to, um, I had to kind of back away from doing golf because they cut the grass. <laughs> Well, at least, you, at least you don't have to mow your own yard anymore. I was no. going to say, if you wanted to sign up as a vendor on Green Pal, we got plenty of lawns for you to mow. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. In Atlanta, we got lawns everywhere for sure. Totally. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, as always, I thank you for being a guest. It was a great time. Thank you, and Vicki. Thanks for having me on. I enjoyed it. I remind everyone that life is a journey and it's up to you to enjoy the ride. This is Vicki Nettling signing off. Thank you for tuning into the Find Your Leadership Confidence Podcast with Vicki Nedling, where we share impactful lessons that help you grow as an individual, grow your confidence, and find the positive and good within you so you powerfully and authentically become the best version of yourself. Remember to visit our website at www.findyourleadershipconfidence.com and enjoy even more great episodes like this one. Again, while you're here, subscribe to us via your favorite network. We look forward to seeing you next time on the Find Your Leadership Confidence Podcast.